Okay, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, huh? Good evening. Um, welcome to the Rockland Public Library. It's great that you all are here this evening with us. And you're in for a, good, a big surprise. We have our mayor in the house. Okay. Yeah. 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 And he's going to share some, some stories and some stuff. So you're in for a treat this evening. Um, just a couple of things I just wanted to tell you. If you want to use the restrooms, the keys are at the um, circulation desk and um, the bathrooms are between the elevator doors, okay? And now I'm gonna have Mark Lindy come up and say a few words, okay? Welcome everybody. As the, the chairman of the library board on behalf of my trustees, one of whom's in the back, Joe, um, our library director, Paul Engel, who's away at a conference, and all of our dedicated library staff, we would like to thank all of you who are here tonight supporting this wonderful series. We are all Americans now, an American immigration dialogue series. That was, uh, got a grant, and uh, we've done a whole bunch of um, these. They're, most of them have been on TV, and we're looking forward to this one. We've covered a lot of issues and topics concerning immigration in our series. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have our mayor, Bill Carpenter, give us a presentation on this topic. We thank him for honoring us with his presence tonight, and we hope you will find something this evening that is important to you or learn something new. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Lucia Shannon, who will introduce the mayor. Welcome, Lucia. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It really is my pleasure to be able to introduce the Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter became a resident of Brockton in 1986. He's the father of six children, many of whom use the East Side Branch Library. He is now serving his third term as mayor of the city of Brockton, and during the first term, he established a new economic development team, including the city's first planner in eight years, which was really an important feature for us to have to go forward, is to have a city planner. It was just um, almost insane not to. And on top of that, he created a main street manager who was really excellent in connecting with businesses up and down Main Street. And he's updated the city's use of technology and has increased diversity on city boards and commissions. I want to put a little plug in here for the fact that he has recognized some wonderful talent within the city. I was so pleased in his first term to see Newbie come on board. Okay. And then and and then he nailed it by getting Darren Duarte, as far as I was concerned, an Emmy Award winning person. Imagine. And then recently at the COA uh, Christmas dinner, who was sitting next to me but Peter, and I'm going to say it wrong, I'm going to try, uh, Zibar. Okay. Zimbar. And I said, I remember you as a kid coming to the library. Now, I meant as a kid working for the cable company, <laughs> because they're all kids to me. And one, one interesting fact that I learned about the mayor uh, is that he has one ancestor like me from Sligo, okay? Now that's unusual. That's like being from Cape Verde and coming from the Isle of Sol. As mayor of the city of Brockton, Bill Carpenter has made substantial revitalization efforts that are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for both businesses and residents throughout the city. He is continuing to improve the city's departmental operations and its delivery of services by investing in technology and utilizing more contemporary methods to increase efficiency in our local government. And this is important. When you go to the website and you want to learn something, you actually can find the information. And I know because I'm a reference librarian for many, many decades. The mayor is recognized as well statewide as a leader in fighting the opiate crisis and was the only mayor selected by Governor Baker to serve on the governor's opioid addiction working group. The first month of his first term, he had a symposium on this epidemic 
over at the War Memorial Building, and I remember it well because our own son lost the first of three good friends from Cardinal Spellman to this, this heroin overdose, the opioid addiction problem. And I said to Sharon Quint, who is the children's librarian, we've got to go. So he's been feet on the ground ever since. He co-founded the Independence Academy, the state's fourth recovery school, and the only, only one in the four, and only the 43rd in the United States, serving teenagers who are re-engaging their education while receiving treatment supports for substance abuse disorders. During his second term, he created the Champion Plan, an addiction outreach pro program meant to help those with substance use disorders in addiction treatment facilities. His unwavering commitment to public safety and community policing has begun to encourage companies to invest and reoccupy distressed business districts by improving the security of neighborhoods and corridors. And for that matter, there were some wonderful uh, young police people who would come to this library and were helpful to us the last couple of years that I was working here and had solid advice to give to us as librarians. Previous to becoming mayor, Bill served four years as the Ward 5 representative to the Brockton School Committee, where he was the chairman of the Facilities Usage Committee, a committee which oversaw a $36 million renovation project for several Brockton schools at a cost of only $7 million to the Brockton taxpayers. Active in the community, Carpenter is perhaps most well known as the radio voice of Brockton High Sports for 17 years and as a radio talk show host, first on WBET and then on WXBR. As a board member and VP of Downey League Little League, he oversaw the development of the Nicholas Richardson Field of Dreams, a complex of Little League diamonds that included the city's first handicapped accessible baseball field and he co-chaired the Rocky Marciano Statue Committee and served as Master of Ceremonies for the statue's dedication. Mayor Carpenter has also served as a volunteer for Brockton Youth Hockey, Brockton After Dark, and Brockton Community Access TV. He is a former member of the Salvation Army Advisory Board and a current member of the Bertocci Club and Enterprise Club. And he is my husband's personal hero. I welcome Mayor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Most very welcome. Nice. Thank you. Well, I think my time is just about up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could have used you during the campaign, Lucia. And uh, there's no truth to the wisecrack that I needed directions to get here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that one coming in. Um, it's really a pleasure to spend some time with you here this evening at the library. Melise, thank you so much for including me in this series. And uh, I think this series has been fantastic. And it's a, what this library really represents and all about. And you're doing a great job in community outreach and involving everyone in the city in our library, so thank you very much for including me. I thought I would tell you a little bit about my own family's background because um, folks sometimes wonder how I ended up being the mayor of Brockton. Uh, I get up some mornings and wonder the same thing myself, uh, but you know, I don't think I'm probably a typical mayor and probably not the typical background, so I thought if we're going to talk a little bit about immigration tonight, I'd tell you a little bit about my family and, and the family that I grew up in. So my parents, uh, my father is of primarily German uh, background. His family were Pennsylvania Dutch immigrants to Pennsylvania and Maryland. And he was actually born in Baltimore, 1927. And um, there's a little other stuff in there, but it's predominantly German, Pennsylvania Dutch, as they refer to those German immigrants in that area. I'll share something with you that I probably haven't told 20 people. I'm going to tell you my middle name. Now, most people do not know my middle name, but it actually impacts this conversation. Um, and we'll try to keep the laughter down. 
Uh, my middle name is Gaither, G-A-I-T-H-E-R. You've probably never known anyone with the middle name Gaither before. Not something I bring up often. However, it relates to, it was a last name in my father's family in Maryland. And there is actually a Gaithersburg, Maryland, where that family is centered from. And they're connected with the same German immigrants that came to Maryland and came to Pennsylvania. And I believe that Gaither was actually the original one that everyone knew about, was a general in the Civil War for the other side. So, um, you know, we all come from very diverse backgrounds, and I don't have any family there, never knew any family there. My father, my father's father worked on the railroads uh, in, back in the 1930s, and uh, he was actually only eight years old when his dad died, and he, his mother came to Boston, and uh, he was raised uh, by a single mother, uh, very poor, there wasn't a whole lot of public assistance, back in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, he, he, um, he was raised, as uh, I said, by a single mom in the 30s and early 40s and grew up in the Depression and served in World War II, enlisted in the Navy at the age of 17, um, served in the Philippines and China, and he's still alive today, which is something I'm really happy about. Uh, 91 years old today and uh, one of the few remaining living World War II veterans, and uh, I'm very thankful for every day I still have him. Um, my mother's side of the family uh, is Irish Catholic, 100%. Uh, and my mother's parents came to the United States in the 1890s as young children brought here by Irish immigrants. Um, my grandfather uh, served in both World War I and World War II uh, and um, was a Navy veteran, was a very interesting guy. For me, growing up in the 60s and 70s, he worked at Fenway Park for 42 years as a part-time job. So I actually, if you come in my office, I have my 1967 World Series tickets in my office, the seats I actually sat in uh, because um, Back then, Mr. Yawkey allowed all the employees to get two tickets to every game. So uh, I had an opportunity to see a couple World Series games as a kid. And I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s hanging around Fenway Park uh, with my grandfather at the, at the ballpark. But my, um, my grandfather was a very interesting guy. So besides being a veteran and working at the ballpark, he was uh, a recovering alcoholic long before it was popular and uh, had been in recovery for decades. Uh, and I never really knew that about him until he explained it to me when he was very old. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't even understand that part. Um, but what was really interesting is his full-time career uh, growing up uh, is that he was a custodian at Harvard and uh, worked there for a long, long time. And I used to, for years, have, I'm not sure where it is now, I had his gold watch from when he retired from the Harvard University Employees Retirement Association. And so when I was a kid growing up, you know, those blue exam books you have in college, they were, I always, he always brought those home from work. I always had those to do homework and things in when I was a kid. Um, and and uh, I loved him, I was very close to him. So I tell you about the part about him being a janitor at Harvard because I think it ties into our immigration series and what immigrant families, which unless you're Native American, we all are, um, that how immigrants can take the opportunity here and when people come here so that their children and grandchildren can have a better life, I think it was very true in my family because in 2016, I was invited by Harvard Medical School to present on the champion plan to a community health forum at Harvard Medical School. And then last year I was invited to present at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And I just thought that, you know, only in America can the grandson of the janitor be invited back to present someday as an adult in what my grandfather would think 
had he been around long enough to see his grandson invited to speak, you know, at the place where his career was, you know, cleaning the bathrooms, and mopping floors. So I think that that kind of tells the story about, in my own family, what immigration really is all about. And the, the story doesn't change, whether you came 100 years ago or you came last week, the story that really doesn't change a whole lot. The other thing I'll tell you about my family, because I think it's impacted, I mentioned to Melissa, I think we're all, I think we're all shaped by our life's experiences. Melissa talked about my work in the opioid addiction crisis in a recovery school. Well, one of my children has struggled with drug addiction since he was a teenager. That's what pushed me in that direction. Had I not been living and still to this day live with this experience, I probably wouldn't have felt quite as strongly. It wouldn't have made the commitment I made to working on that. Um, you know, I watched my mother as a working woman back in the 60s and 70s and 80s be the victim of several different types of discrimination. I saw her experience sexual harassment in the workplace where she had to leave a job because she was being sexually harassed. I saw her discriminated against because of her health uh, later in her, uh, when she was sick. And so these things weren't really big topics necessarily so much in the 70s. However, they certainly shape my thinking on issues today and how we respond to them today and why I have some of the positions that I have on some of those issues. It's from my own experiences in my own life. So, <clears throat> so t getting back to immigration, I think one of the, I think one of the themes that we um, talk about and, and think about here in a city like Brockton that is so diverse, I mean this is, I don't know of a more diverse place in the world than Brockton. I talked to other mayors about it. Um, but I think I learned tolerance growing up in my family at a very young age. Um, so my parents were married in 1956 and my mother was a devout Catholic, my father was a Protestant who was not willing to change. Um, and so they were married by a justice of the peace outside of the church. My mother's entire family, except for one sister, refused to attend the wedding because she was marrying outside of the church. And they, over the years, actually kind of warmed up to my father. Oh, thank you. Um, but uh, they, um, but it was a, you know, that's where our whole family relationship came from that, you know, divided to the point that, you know, her own family would not attend her wedding. Um, and it continued in terms of my view of tolerance as I got just a few years older in the early 60s and mid 60s when I figured out that my mother was a JFK Democrat and my father was a Barry Goldwater Republican and they couldn't have been more far apart on any, almost any political issue. And um, Although one of the things I am very proud of is my father worked very hard in, the, in Ed Brooks' first campaign to become a U.S. Senator. So he's a little bit ahead of his time on that one. Um, but the reason I mention that is I learned my parents loved each other very much till the day my mom passed away, but they came from different religious backgrounds. They rarely agreed on politics, and yet hardly ever said a harsh word to each other in my life. And I think it taught me that you can get along with people who don't agree with you. You can get along with people who don't come from the same background as you. And you can even love each other, even though you've got all these differences, both in differences of opinion and differences of religious background. And by the way, my mother, being excommunicated by the Catholic Church became one of the best Methodists you would have ever met in your life. So she, 
joined the Methodist Church when we were in Mashfield, and she belonged to the Bible study and the women's auxiliary, and she sang in the choir, and she never missed church on Sunday, which was not something you could say about my father. Um, so it was ironic as that happened that she was kicked out of one church and embraced another one. And one of the biggest moments in her life was um, probably when I was in high school, which would have been the early 70s, when she sang a solo in church, in the church choir, and my grandparents came to the church to see her sing. And this was like the final, after all this time, moment of their acceptance that you know, I mean, these were people that had believed that they would get hit by lightning if they went into a Protestant church, um, actually came and sat down in the Protestant church to, to hear her sing. So, um, so that's a lot of stuff about my family. And I do think some of my values today are certainly, and my view on some things are certainly shaped by uh, my upbringing. So I may not look like the product of a mixed marriage, but I am. Um, and so somehow I end up in Brockton, as um, Lucia mentioned, I came here in 1986 and raised my six children here and have several grandchildren here now and um, fell in love with the city and a very different place than what I grew up in in Marshfield. Um, but I, I did absolutely fall in love with the city and I, I still love the city today. So. Brockton with immigration today, I think when I think about the city of Brockton and immigration, I come to the conclusion that immigration is both the past and the future of this city. It's the, you know, we are a lot of who we are because of all the people that have come here in the last hundred and something years. Um, I walk into a city hall every day that was built in 1892 that is just spectacular, that I'm pretty sure most of that tile work was probably done by Italian immigrants. And, you know, in a city that had great ethnic neighborhoods of Polish and French and Lithuanian and Italian. And, um, you know, we've, immigration is our past, it is our character, it is who we are. Um, and at the same token, I believe it's also our future. We are a gateway city made up of all different kinds of folks that are coming from all different places. And I jotted down something I meant to open with, and I'll, I'll close with a quote from him at the end. But, you know, Senator John McCain just released a new book this week. If we were in a library, I'd mention a book. Um, so, uh, in this, uh, one of his lines that, that, that I've read the excerpts, I haven't even got the book yet, but I read the excerpts, and McCain says, we are more alike than different. And I think that speaks a lot to what Brockton is today. We're all these different kind of folks, but if we just sit down to think about it, we're a lot more alike than we are different. And I think the future of this city is celebrating what we have in common, working together on the things that we agree upon, and respecting the differences, and respecting each other. And I truly believe that Brockton is becoming a leading 21st century city. I believe Brockton is ahead of the curve when you think about what American cities will look like in the 21st century. We are, today, I think people would describe Brockton as a multi-ethnic city. I think that in 10 or 20 years, people will describe Brockton as a city of multi-ethnic people because the communities do come together with time. In my own family, I have grandchildren that are half Cape Verdean. What they look like is what the future of America will look like in the, during this next century. And I believe the city of Brockton is on the front edge of that and that we are going to get there faster than a lot of other people are. 
And if we do it right, it's going to be to our advantage. The diversity is going to be the strength of this city. We are a welcoming city where everybody is welcome. And it doesn't matter whether your grandparents came here 100 years ago or you just came here a year and a half ago because everybody is welcome here because we are so diverse and there are different languages spoken and there are different cultures. And part of what brings us together is the public library and the public school system. It's the public school system that provides the level playing field so that every child in the city, we really are a city of opportunity, but it's opportunity for all because every child that attends our public schools gets the same great education and has the same doors of opportunity open to them. I'll tell you, just in this past week, and this is a busy time of year, I had students in my office visiting me from the Empower Yourself program, an after-school financial literacy program. Several of them were on their way to New York City to compete in a national and international competition against not just students from all over the country and all over the world, but largely students of affluent communities and private schools. And yet our students routinely win or place near the top of those competitions. And that's the opportunity that we afford with our public schools, the children growing up here. And so it was the empower yourself. Then I had the other night, I had the JROTC annual gala, 293 students uh, that are cadets in our JROTC. It's a leadership training program. They are the most diverse group of young people you could ever see. And uh, they're all excelling within that program. And then this afternoon we had the Mayor's Youth Summit today at the high school. And I met another 150 or 200 outstanding young people, some of whom I'd just seen at a couple of those other events last week, as they reminded me. Um, but that's what I see. Now, it may not be what you read about in the newspaper, and it may not be what some people say they think they know about Brockton, but that's the real Brockton. That's Brockton today, and that's why this city is becoming a great city, because of that, because this is our strength. And um, I know that, and I appreciate it very much, Melise excerpted from one of my, was it my State of the City address last year or the inauguration this year, our one Brockton theme that you see up behind me. But it really is true that as we go forward, and I think one of my biggest roles our biggest roles, our biggest challenges, but for myself as the mayor and the leader of the city, is to put behind us this notion of old Brockton and new Brockton. That's done, that's dead, that's gone. It may still be alive in some people's minds, but it's not real anymore. Because that's what I saw here over several decades. You know, there's the old Brockton and there's the new Brockton and a divide between the two. And for us to become this 21st century city that I envision us as, that has to be all over now. No more old Brockton, no more new Brockton. It has to be one Brockton. One dream, one team, one fight, one Brockton. And we incorporated the one dream because, we'll talk about dreamers and immigration in a few minutes, but it is the dream. That's the immigration story. The Brockton dream is the American dream. It's to own your own home. It's to have your children get a great education. It's to get a living wage job that you can support your family on. It's for your children to have a better life than you had and your grandchildren to have a better life than them. That's why we're all here. And that's, I think that's the promise that we make. So I know I'm not going to get out of this without talking a little bit about immigration policy, seeing as I am the elected official here in the city. Um, so mayors, 
Mayors have a, a very unique perspective, I think, on immigration. Um, the immigration system in this country is broken. It's broken and it doesn't work. And it has to be fixed at the federal level. Immigration policy is federal. Immigration laws are federal. And the solutions to fixing our broken immigration system are going to have to come down in Washington, D.C. And one of these days, the Congress and the President and the Republicans and the Democrats are going to figure out that they're going to have to actually finally sit down and talk to each other and figure this thing out. It's not the role of mayors. Our role, and we have many roles, but it's not to enforce civilian immigration laws. It's not. But one of our greatest responsibilities is to protect the residents of our cities and to provide safe cities for people to live in, for all people to live in. And I think that as mayors, we focus on community policing. That's where our effort has to be, that the, getting the police department and the community to come together, to work together for the protection of all, to create a place that we all want to live in. And that cannot happen if some of the residents are in fear of the police and are afraid to talk to the police. And that's why I think as mayors, and this is, as I talk to mayors from across the country, and this is a common topic at mayors' conferences, is that when at the, at the local level for mayors, immigration is not really a Republican or Democrat issue. It's about the impact on the lives of the people who live in our cities. And it's about us focusing on protecting the people who live in our cities. And the only way we can do that is by building bridges of trust and communication between all of the people that live in the city and the police department. Now we do have a responsibility, that responsibility to protect the community. We can't pick and choose when we want to think it's important. Um, I've got a statement that I'll share with you that from a letter that I sent to our federal delegation last year. But in the letter I mentioned something about that you know, it's our job um, to remove criminals from our society regardless of their immigration status. All drug dealers, all gang members, all people that shoot people with illegal guns. And it doesn't really matter who they are or where they're from or what their immigration status is. Those folks we have a responsibility to remove from our community. And a phrase that you'll often hear me say is gangs, guns, and drugs, because when I visit my friends in the immigrant communities, many of whom are here today, my, I try to make it real simple. If you are not involved in gangs, guns, or drugs, you have nothing to fear from your city government, because those are the only folks that would ever be asked their immigration status if they're under arrest for committing a serious crime. In my four and a half years as mayor, I can tell you that I've never asked anyone what their immigration status is. I have a lot of friends in all the various immigrant communities in the city. Couldn't tell you what any of their immigration status is because I've never asked any of them. And I can also tell you that we have never detained anybody or refused to post bail for anybody based upon their immigration status because it's not the role of local cities and local law enforcement to enforce civil immigration laws on the federal level that are broken. So there's a couple of handouts I think we're giving out. I'm not sure which one. Is that the letter? Okay, so I, I have two things I'm going to share with you, and I don't want to bury you in things, but I'm just going to highlight a little bit of the letter for you. The letter I, is actually about a year old. Um, this is a letter that I sent to our federal delegation um, about a year ago. 
And I'll also give out another statement that we issued last year also, because I think we've been pretty consistent. Running out of hands here. I can't read without my glasses. So, I'll jump down to the middle and it says, in the absence of federal immigration reform, mayors in their cities continue to seek strategies to protect the safety of all of their residents while ensuring that local law enforcement is focused on community policing. In partnership with our police chiefs, we have strong reservations about any efforts, either through executive action or legislation, to deny federal funds to cities that aim to build trusting and supporting relations with immigrant communities. We believe that the dignity, health, rights, and privacy of all of our residents must be respected, and our cities must ensure that members of our immigrant communities are afforded an opportunity to thrive. And it goes on to give some specific policy recommendations that we've made. Um, and we agree that local law enforcement has to work with federal law enforcement agencies to keep the city safe. We agree that borders need to be secure. We agree that we need to improve um, the um, method of employment verification. I mean, these are legitimate issues that have to be addressed. But we also believe in a framework that enables people of goodwill currently living in the shadows to come out and fully pursue the American dream. And we believe in that too. I'll also, we, did we give out the other one, Melise? Oh, yeah. All right. The one other hand, I'm only going to give you two handouts, but I thought this other one was a policy statement that I issued on behalf of the city in January of 17. So this is over a year ago. But I thought it was important that the city have a position on race and equity. And so this, uh, this following statement of policy for the city of Brockton says that we believe in and stand for values of inclusion, equity, and justice. That we welcome all people and recognize the rights of individuals to live their lives with dignity free of discrimination because of their faith, race, national origin, immigration status, or sexual orientation. We will continue our work in making our services and programs accessible and open to all individuals, and we believe in the public sector for the public good. Advancing equity and inclusion is critical to the success of our city and our nation. And whether that's making sure that it's equal educational opportunities for everyone growing up in the city, if it's helping to support immigrant-owned small businesses to succeed and thrive in the city, along with women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses, uh, we are committed to doing that and we are committed to being a city of opportunity for all. And I'll give you one final statement and a quote, and then I'll open it up for questions. As soon as I figure out what I do with my glasses, there we go. So I think I'm <clears throat> with most mayors in terms of <clears throat> what I think immigration policy needs to be. <clears throat> I'll get the water in a second there. And in a, a statement that we issued, we said, we believe the time is ripe for Congress to pass legislation that fixes immigration and creates a system that builds our economy, meets the nation's future workforce requirements, eliminates the incentives to enter the country illegally, humanely deals with the undocumented persons already here, and works to keep families together. And that says a lot, but I think that all of those goals can be consistent. And that that's the direction we must work in and we must work in together. So I think I've tried to give you a little bit of my personal background, a little bit of my vision of the future of the city and how 
immigration plays such a key role in it, and um, a little bit of policy as an elected official, an elected leader of the city in terms of how federal immigration policy impacts us on a local level. So would you like me to take some questions or what do you want me to do? Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna help a little bit on this front. Hmm? Melissa asked me to sort of help on this front. We're going to just take a few questions. They have to be directly related to the topic at hand this evening. And I have a personal stake in this because there's usually my favorite cookies up there in the art room. So we can talk further up there while we enjoy some of White's best, <laughs> okay? All right, hands. Ossie, can I start with you? Yes. Um, the question I have is, what do you consider your best? You can pick it from any reason that you talk about. So I'll leave that by the What is your best? What is the most agonizing thing that you've had to do since you've been there? Uh, and I won't say mayor, because wow. back to your earlier. Well, no, I, I um, sure. So I'll try to paraphrase it. I think Ozzy is asking me my best, best and worst experiences. Would that be the right word to use? Best and worst experiences, uh, specifically in terms of immigration, or just in general, my experience as the mayor. Boy, it's a tough one. Thanks. <laughs> supposed to be up here to help me. Um, I think that there's a lot more best than there is worst. Um, I think that as mayor, most of the best things you do are the things people never hear about. Um, I, I think that mayors help people. That's like a big part of the, the, of, of the mission is to help people. And most of that help when we're trying to help people, you never hear about it, and it can take a lot of different forms. Um, it could be, um, well, we had a situation in my first year or two where um, we had a patrolman at the top of the promotion list at the police department uh, who was dying of cancer and we created an additional temporary position so that we could promote him. And we were scheduling to promote him on a Saturday. And I got a call from the family on a Monday that he'd taken a bad turn for the worse. So this was in 15, the first of those big blizzards. So on a Monday night in a snowstorm, myself and the city clerk and the police chief and one or two other folks went out to his house and. Uh, on his hospice bed in his living room, promoted him and signed him in and made him a sergeant. And uh, he went to sleep a couple hours later and never woke up again. Slipped into a coma that day and passed away a couple days later. Like he was hanging on waiting for that promotion. And um, something I never talk about, something we never talked about publicly, folks in the police department know about it, but I think that's, it's those types of things. That's, that's one that really sticks in my head, and, and there are hundreds of them. Um, I think the worst part of the job, or the worst experiences, I think is what you asked me, I think the worst experiences are around tragedies. And um, I feel as though that there's an important role for the mayor when tragedies happen, that it's important for me to let people who know in the city that have suffered some tragedy, that we care about them, that we're here as a community to help them, uh, and that we're suffering as a community along with them. So I think, I'm gonna give you my personal one in this one, Ozzy, and we've, I'm, unfortunately I've been to a lot of tragedies in four and a half years. Uh, but my biggest frustration as mayor is that, um, I guess it's been about three years now, a, a terrific young man by the name of Carl Yancey was hit and killed by a car on Belmont Street. And to this day, we've never found the driver who left him on the side of the road to die. 
and I don't know exactly what happened in the accident because I, we don't have a witness at this point. But what I do know is the driver knew he hit somebody, he or she hit somebody, and they left. That part I do know. I know they left him there where he died on the side of the road. And um, Kyle's mom is just uh, one of the most beautiful ladies you would ever meet. And uh, I stay in touch with her. But I think my biggest frustration is that we still have not found that driver. And I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't think about the fact that she and Kyle's family really don't have closure until we identify that driver and explain to her exactly what happened to her son. Is that a best and a worst for you? Usually you have to buy me a beer to get those stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, somebody else, Lucia? Do we have this nice lady who you oh. who introduced your boy? Andrew, yeah. Wanted to know um, how, what do you think we can do as individuals to help the perception of Rockdale to people who don't know how You could have given me that one in advance, Andrea. Um, uh, no, no, I get it. No, I think that um, I think the I think one of the biggest challenges that we face as a city, and it was here long before I got here, is changing the perception of the city, particularly the perception of Brockton by people on the outside of the city. And I think it's. A very complex answer. I think it's something we're working very hard on. Uh, I'm working with with Lynn and some great people on uh, building neighborhood associations to improve communication uh, with neighborhoods in the city, back and forth in both directions, so that we're more aware of issues that impact neighborhoods, um, and that folks that live here feel as though that they can be heard. I also think that. The revitalization of the downtown is critical, and it's happening. You don't see yet what you're going to see in the next 12 to 24 months, because I do think that people driving through the city from the outside, <clears throat> not just in Brockton, but tend to judge a city by the appearance of its downtown, and our downtown has been depressed for a long time. And we're bringing it back. I think market rate housing is the key, and mixed use is the key. But when it falls back to the mayor, clean, well-lit, safe, those are where we've got to be. People have got to feel as though they can get out of their car safely, feel comfortable, feel as though it's well-lit, feel as though it's safe. And I think we're making tremendous progress in that area, but we've got work to go. And some of that perception of the downtown, I think, is unfairly characterized by the fact that we have a chronic homeless population downtown. And we've got to be willing not just to complain about the homeless and suggest that we lock them all up somewhere or bus them out of town, but to really be willing to compassionately work on the issues that are causing them to be homeless. So if folks are struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues and unemployment and the other challenges they face, we've got to try to get them connected to services and, and get them to uh, be able to address the things that are the underlying causes of their homelessness. And I don't think it's necessarily quite that simple for everyone, but we're working on that. And you know, we've opened a program downtown a couple days a week to start called The Haven daytime resource center where people can attend group counseling, get access to the internet on the computer, um, connect with substance abuse services and mental health services, and I see my friend the pastor here, faith-based services, faith-based services. Because as a city government, we can't be afraid to work with faith-based organizations and partnerships without, you know, we all know who's on which team. Doesn't mean we can't work together. We have to work together. The challenges are too big not to work together. Um, and we also have to create transitional housing, which we've been afraid to do in the city, but they've done it very successfully in Quincy. We have to do it here. They have to be small, 
micro unit efficiency type units with wraparound services with low cost where people can have permanent housing to get out of homelessness and be able to stay there and afford to stay there and get the services to help them stay there and we're working on a pilot project for that but it's, it's not a politically popular thing it's not it's, it's not a winner at election time but it's a reality we have to be willing to take on we can't complain about the homeless if we're not going to help them Thank you. Mark. You know, how important is the education equity issue? You know, you're chair we're on the school committee, you're chairman of the school committee, and Brockton is sending the bus for the kids Thursday to the state. So uh, the question is around equity and education funding with the state and our public schools. Um, so I feel very strongly on it. You're going to see things happen. Uh, the Chapter 70 formula for state education to local communities on which Brockton, like any other gateway city, relies upon for about 80% of its classroom funding. Uh, that formula is broken. Uh, it was created in 1993. It's never been updated. It does not fairly reimburse for the cost of educating low-income students. It does not uh, fairly reimburse for the cost of educating special education students. It does not fairly reimburse for the cost of educating English language learners. And in any gateway city like Brockton, that describes a lot of our students. And so in that, in my mind, it is discriminatory uh, in the way it's being implemented now. Um, and when you combine that with how the state is currently forcing us to pay for charter schools, and I'm not against charter schools. I favor choice. My problem with this is with how they're paying for them because the charter schools are targeting urban areas. And then what the state does is deduct every dollar of education money you get for each student that goes to the charter school and gives it to the charter school. This year, the state took $15 million off the top of our education money. We go from a $10 million deficit to a $5, $5 million surplus if they're not deducting charter school tuitions from our money. Um, and I think that's also unfair and discriminatory because the charter schools do not target places like Wellesley and Newton and Waltham. And so therefore those communities don't contribute little or anything towards the cost of charter schools. And because this particular education commissioner is a zealot for creating charter schools. They're, they're balancing the cost of charter schools on the backs of poor urban students. And that's the part that's wrong. And that's the part that has to be fixed. And that's why I can guarantee you that within the next two or three months, we will file an equity and education lawsuit against the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because we can't get them to do it legislatively. We can't seem to advocate for it. We'll go back to the courts just like we did in the 80s and get a judge of, to force them to do the right thing. But that's going to take several years. And in the meantime, we have to live within our means and do the best we can and uh, put our kids first. So the, the gentleman's talking about the, the, the great work that's done down at the Neighborhood Health Center. We actually had a meeting with the Neighborhood Health Center today around traffic safety and pedestrian safety because we've had so many bad accidents at that intersection of Main Street and Legion Parkway right there. And uh, we're, working, we're working hard with them and an engineer in, in both some short-term and long-term solutions because we've got to make that area safer. And I think part of it's going to be enforcement. We watched some video of some of the accidents that have happened in that intersection. And in every case, somebody is speeding and running through a red light over and over and over. Downtown, right at the, right, the neighborhood health, right at that Legion Parkway and Main Street, right where the neighborhood health center sits on the corner. And they're working with us, and we're, we're going to come up with some solutions for that because it's dangerous there. No, I, I just, you got me thinking about neighborhood health center. Right, right. Everybody is serviced inside. We actually, 
along your lines, we were there a week or two ago uh, when we announced uh, receiving $3 million in federal grant money to pay for uh, removing lead from residences of low and moderate income families in the city because we know that uh, low income children in, the, in certain sections of the city are just disproportionately likely to be exposed to lead paint. And we've, uh, this money, we're gonna be able to distribute a million dollars a year for the next three years to help low and moderate income families get the lead out of their houses and apartments, which is a significant public health issue for the safety of our children in a city like Brockton. I'll give you a quick example. Flint, Michigan, all over the news, last couple of years, right? They've got lead in the water, we're spending the billions of dollars to get them a new water system. The percentage of children in Flint with elevated uh, lead paint, lead, elevated lead levels in their blood is 5%. We have some neighborhoods in the city of Brockton where the percentage of children with elevated lead is 10%. I'm not saying the whole city is an average, the city is an average is two or three percent. But we have some neighborhoods, some tracks, census tracks, where the percentage is as high as 10 percent. We're spending billions of dollars to fix the water in Flint, and I'm not against that, I support that. But our children, particularly in certain neighborhoods in the city where the older housing stock is, where the multifamily houses are, are just as at risk as the children in Flint are. And that's why we've been able to get this funding and the Neighborhood Health Center is a great partner working with us to identify the families that need to get that lead out of there, whether it's their home or their apartment. Ma'am. Our water is very safe. We've got great water here. Um, it does not have fluoride, but that's being looked at by the Board of Health right now. The fluoride question is a little more complicated in Brockton. And the reason why is that the majority of communities in Massachusetts have fluoride in their water now, but many like Brockton also do not. The, I don't think there's much of an argument about the benefit of it, however, someone's got to explain to me how we pay for it. Because what Brockton, what makes Brockton a little more unique is that our drinking water comes from three different sources all into the same water system. So you actually have to fluoridate in at least three different plants to put the fluoride into the drinking system. And so we have just um, working with the Board of Health we have agreed uh, to participate in a grant will give us, I know, sixty or eighty thousand dollars to do the feasibility study so that we can get the answers from the engineers as to exactly what would be required to do it and what would the cost be. Because I think we need to find out the price and then have a conversation with the taxpayers that are going to pay for it to make sure that the taxpayers are willing to pay for it. It could be a million dollars or more. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mayor. I hope you join us upstairs for those White's cookies, and I wish everybody would come on up and share their ideas uh, and have good conversations. Thank you for coming. And before we leave and go upstairs, don't forget we have one more forum. June. Oh, okay. Huh? June 5th, the last one, okay? It's going to wrap up the series, okay? So June 5th will be the last time born that we're going to have here at the library. So I hope I see all of you there next month, June 5th. But now, you can go upstairs and you enjoy the life refreshment. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.